Hello and welcome to another episode of Launch Legends. Today we speak with Wes Bush of Product Like Growth. Wes goes into detail about his successful book. But before we go ahead, if you're listening to this on a podcast, please rate and review. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and leave a review. Hey, well, thank you for being on the show. So let's talk about who you are and uh, what you do. Absolutely. Where would you like to start? There's so many places. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you wrote this really great book, uh, Product Like Growth. Let's talk about what came to your head that you wanted to write the book. Yeah, so product led growth, before I even had heard about this uh, new concept, I was doing it for years and years. And so for me, it really started, I was working at this B2B SaaS company doing very traditional demand generation, you know, the kinds where you create a guide or an ebook or a white paper, you put it behind the landing page, you request people to fill out their contact info before they get access to that. Um, so we were using like this very traditional demand gen process. And it wasn't until we launched a freemium product when I started to realize, oh, wait, um, this old way is super expensive. Like our cost per leads were anywhere from $50 to $150 per lead. And so then we looked at this freemium model and it was driving hundreds of thousands of users in a very short period of time. And so when that happened, it kind of clicked for me. I saw the product mm -hmm. wasn't just something we sold. It was the growth engine for the business. And so that's really what got me super excited about product led growth because uh, your product is so much more than just something you sell. So um, Wes, you, you said that you went, um, rather than hiding the product behind like a wall, you actually made a freemium version of it, your, your, your company did. Was that a freemium version of the core product or you built another product which you gave for free and then whoever joined that product, you just kind of upsold your um, core product? Let's talk about so that. In yeah, this particular case, it was a completely new product that was freemium. And so that was really good because at that particular company, it was larger. And if you're a big company trying to just, you know, roll out freemium on your main cash cap products, it can be a really bumpy ride. And so I don't usually recommend it to just make that big change right away for people. Okay, great. So let's talk about product like growth itself and the book. Yeah. And so what specific parts do you want to learn about? So let's talk about the whole process, man. I'm uh, really keen to learn it. Okay. So how to write the book or how it really went? No, what's in the book? What do you teach in the book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could have just gone on for a tangent there about how to write it. Yeah. But um, <laughs> okay. So when it comes to what is in the book, there's three parts. Mm -hmm. The first one is really just trying to understand about your strategy. Is product-led growth even the right fit for your business? And in some cases, although product-led companies, they have a much lower customer acquisition cost, they're just way more capital efficient than their sales-led counterparts. Mm -hmm. And there's some scenarios where it, it might make a ton of sense for you to have a sales-led company. And let's say you're in a new market, you're creating a blue ocean. Just to give you an example, Sales like companies are really helpful because they educate the customer mm -hmm. in that particular case. But uh, right now in the world we live in, it's never been easier to create companies. And so every market is becoming a red ocean very quickly. And so you need, it's just like a matter of time before you need that product led mm -hmm. arm of the business. And so that's the first part. And then the second part of the book is all about what is a, a product led foundation look like? What is it really built on? And mm -hmm. I argue in the book, there's really just three things. I think a lot of people try and overcomplicate it. It's really just understand your user, what are their problems, how you can help them uh, communicate that value to them so they can really understand the, the perceived value of your product mm -hmm. to a T. And then the last part is just deliver on that value as soon as humanly possible. So that's really the, the core foundation of building a product-led business. And then the last piece of the book, which is my favorite, mm -hmm. is all about how do you take that to the next level mm -hmm. and really serve those users much better and create a product experience that helps them become a happy paying customer. So great. Let's talk about someone who followed, one of your clients or someone you knew, someone you know, you know who followed the whole book, the whole process. Let's talk about what kind of product did they, did they build using your process? 
Yeah. So the main kind of applications I've seen a huge success for people on is really around tackling this whole concept of time to value. Mm -hmm. Because I argue like a world-class product experience, it's like this. You have your perceived value, what you promise someone, then your experience value on the other hand. And the best products in the world, they have that experience where it's really quick. Like you start using that product, you start experiencing the value of that product quick. Mm -hmm. But a lot of B2B SaaS companies, there's this really long process. And sometimes that could take a, a week. Sometimes that could take a month before you actually understand, hey, uh, I really understand how to use this product, how it's going to help me. And so mm -hmm. when you tackle that time to value, there can be some incredible benefits to your business. Uh, one of the, my favorite examples, uh, their company is called snappa.com. Mm -hmm. And so they had thousands and thousands of signups every single week. And when we looked at it, we found that there's about 27% of those signups, they just didn't activate their email address. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really common step for a lot of SaaS companies. Mm -hmm. You just sign up and then you're kind of required to go into your email, click, I'm a real human, mm -hmm. and then you can go into the product. Mm -hmm. And so it, it doesn't seem like much, but what that's really doing is creating a longer time to value. Mm -hmm. And so when you we actually delayed that step and didn't require first-time users to do that, we saw that his monthly recurring revenue went up 20% wow. almost overnight. And so it's really kind of fascinating to me, at least, um, how whenever you reduce friction and make it easier for someone to experience the value of your product, what the end result usually is, is upgrades. Because when people experience the value of your product, that's actually when your product has sold itself. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to people where they said that, look, if they give freemium model where they just give out the part of the product free to their users, what happens is a lot of people come, you get a lot of people who just sign up, but they never use it no matter what and no matter how easy they use it to make it, they still come and they just churn and move on to something else. What do you say to that? So in this uh, use case, if I understand correctly, this is going to be someone who signs up for the product uses it, and then just doesn't want to actually upgrade? Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so in those particular cases, that's, that's always going to potentially be a way where someone's going to use the product, they don't like it, mm -hmm. and that's what's going to happen. But I actually found that that's not the majority of cases. What a lot of people think is that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. But when you actually look into the data, here's the real stat that's scary that most people don't know. 40 to 60% of your users who sign up for your product will use it once and never come back. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a massive amount of people who just never got to value. So a lot of founders will say to themselves, oh, like people are trying out our product. They're uh, just not coming back. What, why is this? And the biggest thing is because they haven't really thought about that first time user experience. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the core frameworks I share in the book is all about bowling. Mm -hmm. And let's just take it out of the product world into bowling for a second. Mm -hmm. So you have a bowling ball. It's your first time playing bowling, let's say. You throw that ball down the alley. What are the chances of it going into the gutter? If it's your first time, like most people... They're going to get in the gutter. I know I did. Uh -huh. First time playing bowling, it's a gutter ball. Mm -hmm. And so whenever it comes to your product, we're expecting people to basically strike out mm -hmm. in that first experience. And it's so unrealistic. It's like, wait a minute, buddy. This is not going to be that easy for that person, especially if we don't even guide them mm -hmm. in the least of what they need to do in that product to strike out. Mm -hmm. And so... The whole kind of bowling alley framework I go through in the book is really about like, how could we even use bumpers in the product to like walk people through those exact steps they need to do to strike out? So how would that apply to a company that's really B2B? For example, one of my friends, he sells service management software to plumbers, electricians, and uh, construction workers. And now he tried the model where part of his product was free and he saw a bunch of people sign up, but didn't matter what he did, they would just churn. They would never use a product. But, so instead, he had to put up a demo where people just sign up for a demo and they had to be taken, uh, you know, taken to sales, you know, salesperson and then salesperson had to sell them. And then after that, you know, the, 
the, the customer would be given to the onboarding team. And then there was this whole three months onboarding. Only then he found that he could sell and he could get people to use the application. He tried this whole premium approach. It just didn't work out. What, what would you say to a company like that? What should they do? So, yeah, there's a ton of things that could potentially be the case. Mm-hmm. But I was literally on a call with someone else yesterday with a very similar problem. Mm-hmm. And I'll go through there uh, yeah. what we identified as the problem. And maybe it'll be similar for your friend too. So they had the same thing. They had a freemium model. They found that whenever they, they hopped on onboarding calls, um, there was a really high percentage of these people who were actually going to convert whenever they got them on a call. Hmm. So when we're in the, the session, I'm like, okay, please like get that, that sales rep. I want them on this call because they're doing the majority of your onboarding for you. And so we started a conversation around, well, what do you, what do you talk to them about? What are you walking them through? And in this case, there's like a couple key things that they needed to do. One was all about like segmentation, just understanding like what kind of program you're running. And so. The, the core problem we identified in this particular case is people didn't understand the full value of the product. They didn't understand what that better life was. Mm-hmm. And so whenever they were going through the onboarding, although it was super straightforward mm-hmm. of what to do, they're basically giving people pieces of Lego, but they weren't showing people the end result of what they could build with those Lego pieces. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times in SaaS products, uh, we promise people like, here's your hot and ready bowl of spaghetti, get it in five minutes. But they don't realize that a lot of times when you go to that restaurant, you got to go into the restaurant and then the server shows you to the kitchen. Mm-hmm. There's all these ingredients and they're like, you got to make it. <laughs> it's like, okay, there's a lot more to this than just that hot and ready spaghetti in five minutes. So um, sometimes this product Founders, we can go through, uh, maybe arrange all the ingredients. So it's super easy for someone to make that final product using our product. And so, um, that's the, the big thing. There's one piece is like, what is that end goal? How can we help people understand what that is? And the second piece is how can we get people there way quicker? Great, great. So let's, let's talk about your book, the actual launch of your book. I mean, this is launch legends, right? So. Yep. How did you launch your book and what kind of numbers did you do? Yeah. So in the, the first, I think it was month, there was about 5,000 people who ordered the book. And so in terms of like how that process worked, hmm. uh, like, do you want to go through the yeah, actual writing of the yeah. book? <laughs> yeah. Another writing of the book. How did you launch the book? Okay. Yeah. So the launch of the book, it was self-published through Amazon. So that was one of the things Mm -hmm. I did do quite a bit of research ahead of time on what are those categories that you could definitely win on. Mm -hmm. And I forget the, um, the name of the actual product I use, but there's like some really cool products out there where you can really figure out what are those categories that are the best for you. Mm -hmm. Just like any keyword research Mm -hmm. on Amazon. But that was one of the pieces. There was also my list, which at that time was around, I think 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't massive or anything else like that. Mm -hmm. I did have a wait list before Mm -hmm. and that was going for about like six months while I was writing the book itself. So I was gathering a lot of people. And I did also send the book out to a bunch of like influencers, key people who had read it ahead of time and leave reviews. And so the, that was really in a nutshell, like some of the major things. I also had a few partners that uh, my business just collaborates with that we share each other stuff. And so we were going ahead with that. And then guess hosting was the last one and then doing a podcast circuit. So right. yeah, it was basically like trying everything at once. <laughs> Let's go back a little bit. So when you built your email list over six months, were yeah. you staying in touch with your list over time or you just, you were building the list and eventually you just did the launch. How did you nurture the list? Yeah. So I was doing a weekly newsletter at that time. Mm, great. And then on the, at the particular launch, was there just one big event where you blasted that out to your list and then you're, was to tell influences as well, or it was incremental? Yeah, so I just like spent that entire week like promoting for the first week of the launch. And so that was the main focus for everything I was doing, it seemed like. And then there was that consistent effort at the end of it too, whether it was like doing more of those podcasts mm-hmm. uh, and other pieces around the book as well. Great. 
So did you, what was the purpose of the book after? Did you win any contracts or any consultancy contracts after that? Yeah, I mean, it's more of a positioning tool than anything else, especially in, I don't know, my category right now. And so that was one of the pieces is the positioning. But the second is, yeah, there is no doubt more contracts coming in than there was before if I compare it from that end. But it's really like weird how you monetize a book because I wouldn't like say, write a book for the money. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> like, I mean, when you look at like your royalties, it's like, it's really not much. It's not like a massive amount of money or anything like that. So um, yeah, it's don't write the book for the money. It's like, what will this help you get? And so in this case, I was also doing like more speaking and stuff like that. So that definitely catered more towards that um but yeah the main goal wasn't definitely the money but how did you have a monetization plan after the launch the monetization has been a work in progress i would say i I wouldn't say i had like i mean some authors they write the book as basically lead gen for a course or something like that so it's more strategically well thought out than what i was doing Mm -hmm. and maybe that'll change maybe the next edition of it will have more of that baked in but yeah initially there there wasn't much other than consulting that time was one of the biggest ways of monetization as well as workshops great and then uh, what about the product led growth uh sorry the summit How did that come about? Yeah. And so that really came about because I was doing already tons of these interviews for the book. And I just loved it. Like talking to (laughs) some really smart people is always fun. And so it was really just a way of like, you know, there's tons of podcasts out there. How could I differentiate and create an experience where it's a little bit different. You can get like a Netflix binge watch of all the content on a particular topic. And so I just wanted to experiment with that format. And after the first summit, I realized I'm like, wait, like this is such a, a fun way to build an audience mm-hmm. and authority at the same time. And so I just kept doing it. Like I'm this end of July, we're gonna have the the fifth one. So it's been a, quite a few. Wow. So how often did you do them? Is it every couple of months? Uh twice a year. Twice a year. Great, great, great. So what's uh what's the plan going forward with your product like growth and the summit? Yeah, so really building up the audience, that's one of the the key focuses right now. And then the second part is going to have more of a platform approach where other people can create different courses around product-led growth because it's not like you could just have a one-off course around this particular topic because it's like your sales, your marketing, support, uh, even success team, like they all have to work differently in a product-led business. And so it's going to be really cool to put that all together and at least have a place where people can download all that information. Great. Wes, thank you very much for being on the show and uh, great to have you on board and uh, let's speak to you soon. No worries. Thanks for having me.